So finally we return to the attenuator board that we uh, have looked at previously. Now this is a new PCB and we've corrected our wiring error and it's working as it should. So that's good. And now we move on to the issue of how do we come up with the binary number to apply at the input here. Now I did say I was going to use a microcontroller and at some stage I dare say I will. But in the meantime I thought I'd try a different approach. I thought, what I'll do, I'll use a pot as a voltage divider, an ABC chip, and a bit of logic, and we'll see if we can make it work that way. And that's been interesting, to say the least. So you might think that's a relatively simple problem, and it mostly is, except that our ADC despite being an 8-bit device and us only needing 6 bits, it doesn't promise accuracy all the way down to the least significant bit. So basically the least significant bit is not to be trusted. Now, I naively thought that I've got 7 clean bits, only need 6, how hard could it be? And the answer is harder than you think. Because of the nature of arithmetic, that least significant bit can, through the miracle of carrying, end up just about anywhere, depending on the value in question. So by way of demonstration, um, I've got a simple version of this set up on a breadboard. Yes, Harry, a breadboard. And I've just got the output of one bit. This is the most significant bit. So I'll just apply that to the input there. And because that's the most significant bit, if I find the halfway point on the pot here, there we go. And it, if I get just on that halfway point, and just get it to sit there, whoa, yeah. There we go. That's really nasty. So there's the nature of the problem. I had various schemes to try and deal with this. Of course, if you had a microcontroller, this would be a doddle. Um, be a very simple thing to deal with, but not so easy without. I had various goes at this, uh, came up with various schemes of varying levels of complexity, most of them just getting completely out of hand, to be honest. Uh, but I think I've pared it down to something reasonably simple, and something which I believe is going to work reliably, and we're not going to get this relay chatter problem. Um, that uh, I just demonstrated. So let's have a look at that. Okay, here it is. So the business part of it is this pot here and we're heading towards that output there. Um, but the only other curly thing is we do have the mute pin there. So we've got a switch and a flip-flop uh, which we're using to uh, invert on each touch of the switch and an LED to indicate when we're in mute. Okay, so apart from that, it's all to do with the ADC. So I've buffered the voltage divider with an op amp. And in this case, I've gone with a low voltage op amp. I could have uh, used the plus minus 15 volt supply that's elsewhere uh, in this project, uh, could have brought this, uh, brought that supply to this board, but rather than do that, I've gone with a low voltage op amp, and what I've done is I've added some extra resistors here and here to restrict the range of this, so it doesn't touch the power rail on either side. That way, I can just run the op amp off of the zero to five volt supply, and that's all good. Now. What I've done is I have used the second op amp to implement a third order low pass filter because it seemed like a good idea at the time. So that's uh, got a roll off at about four or five hertz, I believe. So it's, it's not super low. Um, uh, it shouldn't sort of uh, make it lag behind your movements too much, but I just wanted to try and get the cleanest possible uh, voltage here, and I particularly wanted to try and get um, a low impedance here because I, I did experiment uh, without this buffering with different values of this pot, and I did find that 
um, if this pot was too high in value and we had sort of a high impedance um, voltage source here, that the ADC was more likely to uh, create errors and uh, more bits would be noisy and it just helped to um, have a nice low impedance voltage source. So gone with the buffering, I've gone with the filter, we could leave that out to be honest, but it's just a few passives and I've already bought them, so I might as well leave it in. Okay, so we come in to the ADC chip here, voltage input, these two rails here form the reference plus and minus voltages, and they're going to be some offset from the, uh, the, the zero and the plus five volt rails. Now, the outputs here are eventually going to be latched by this flip-flop here. So we've got octal uh, flip-flop, uh, which we're using to latch what's eventually going to go to the output. So these outputs here are latched, uh, but only while the read input here is low. So if you send read low, uh, this thing will acquire a value that'll take about a microsecond and it will appear on the outputs there. And that will stay there until read goes high again. So we're going to need some kind of output latch because of course we need this output to be permanent. Uh, we need our relays to stay in whatever state they're in. Okay, so I had various schemes I played with previous to this. I, I was playing with the idea of having a second um, flip-flop here and uh, we were sort of latching, looking at the current value and the previous one and uh, just using an exclusive NOR gate to decide whether or not the least significant bit was different between the two and that sort of worked. Um, and then I hit upon these binary comparator chips. So these are 4-bit binary comparators and we can use those to compare all 8 bits between here and here. Now, initially I was just comparing for equality. Uh, it just seemed to be uh, a more compact way if you wanted to check more than one bit rather than having uh, a whole bunch of uh, exclusive NOR gates and then ending them together and it's just turning into an awful lot of chips. So I thought, oh, that's sort of, sort of compact, that's kind of neat. Um, and so that's where I discovered those. And I've actually come up with another idea. So what I'm doing here is I'm looking at the difference between what we've got latched to the output and the current value that we've got coming out of the ADC. And we have, when they're equal, that'll be high. If the ADC value is greater than the output, that'll be high, and vice versa, that one will be high. Okay, so what do we do with that? Aha, uh -huh. all right. So what we've got here is a four bit presetable up-down counter. And this was an idea, I'd actually uh, play with the idea of having three of these cascaded forming a 12 bit counter. I was actually using the output of, of the top eight bits of that to drive into here, but I've come up with this other idea. It's a little bit simpler. So what I do is I look at, okay, if let's say value at the ADC is less than the value at the output, then what I do is I count up. Likewise, in the other direction, I count down. This is all dependent on this compare pulse coming in here, by the way. Now, the clever bit is, when they're equal, this is a presetable counter, so what I do is I put the value eight into the counter. So this is a four bit counter, it's counting naught to 15. Eight's the nearest thing I can put to halfway. Kind of want seven and a half, but that's not gonna happen. So that's what we do on equality. So what we're doing on either carry or borrow, we are latching the current ADC value to the output. 
So what that means is that if we have a run of consecutive sampled values that are either above or below the current output value, then we'll grab that and bung it to the output. The clever bit is that every time we get a value which is equal, we reset the count back to the middle. So typically when we're just adjusting the pot, we need 16 values in order to get this to latch to the output. And in cases where you're keeping it still and the least significant bit is jumping around, every time we hit being the two being equal, we reset the magic value eight back into the counter. And so we need either seven or eight consecutive samples that are either above or below the, the current output value in order to change the output value. So that's the idea there. Now, we needed to generate a fairly clever clock because we needed, if we weren't gonna have a second flip-flop uh, in order to uh, latch this output, we had to do all of this stuff while these outputs were active. So there was a little bit of timing I had to get right there. And it's interesting, I was looking at this um, 4047 clock chip and I saw, oh, we've got, I've got two outputs there, one inverted, and we've got this output here, which is at double the frequency. So these are obviously derived from that. And I thought, oh, look, we could, uh, we could just end those together and we could come up with the, the clock that we need. And that turns out to be a really bad idea. Uh, and the problem is that these outputs here lag behind this one by at least 200 nanoseconds. And that's enough to get glitches. So I've gone with something a bit simpler. I've gone with a 4017 got some of those lying around, so that's easy enough. Now, read is active low, so that's quite easy. We can just have that go high on this step here. Uh, it'll be low at every other time, so we'll actually be uh, holding data on the outputs there. And basically, compare goes high and low whilst read is held low, and we definitely have some data to look at. So, um, compare comes in here, which is used with these NAND gates here. Uh, the up-down um, inputs to the counter, a little bit unusual in that um, it'll only count up or down if the other one is high. That's why we've, we've gone with these NANDs here. Um, and Oddly enough, we've managed to get away with just one quad NAND gate. We didn't need any other gates. At various times, I've had an awful lot of of logic chips, but we've pared it down to just that. As I said before, we've got a dual flip-flop here. We're just using one side of it to drive the mute. We are, with a little RC circuit, we are pulling the reset input low on startup because I don't want it to power up in mute because that would be annoying. But that's basically it, he says. I'm going to do some more experiments on the breadboard, maybe not build the whole thing, but at least prove uh, the concept of uh, a few more elements of it before I uh, go ahead and uh, make a PC board. But that's where I'm currently at with this. Um, I hope that was enjoyable and thanks again for watching.